Hey, it is Dr. John Terry, the Black Belt Leader, and welcome to the Black Belt Leadership Podcast, where each week I'm giving you tips, tools, insights, and resources to become a better version of who you are and what you do. Now, today I want to talk about duct taping the check engine light. You may say, John, what in the world does that have to do with leadership? Well, trust me, there's a leadership lesson in this, but today's lesson, I'm going to warn you, is going to be a little bit heavy. But I want to start with the premise for the story. And it's it's a very valuable but very expensive lesson my life and I, my wife and I learned shortly after we got married. Now, prior to my wife and I marrying and coming together as a married couple and living together, she had her car, I had mine. Mine was a stick shift, hers wasn't. When we got married, moved into the same house and began to live life together. She drove her car. I drove mine. She couldn't drive stick. I didn't want to drive her car because I loved my stick. So as a result of that, I never took the time to do the maintenance on her vehicle. I should have. Yeah, you can guess where this story's going already, don't you? So a few weeks after we were married, my wife called and she said, she said, John, I went out to start the car to run some errands and the car made a weird noise, but it won't start. Well, I'm thinking it's a battery. So I told her I'd look at it when I got home. When I got home, I changed clothes thinking I was going to have to change the battery and went out and attempted to start the car. I put the key in the ignition and turned it, and it made a strange noise that immediately told me it wasn't the battery. It was something else, and I didn't have a clue what that was. So I popped the hood and began to look inside to see if I could, through examination, figure out what was going on. A good friend of mine who is a mechanic happened to be driving by the house. He saw me with my head stuck in the hood of a car and knew I knew very little about cars. So he turned around and pulled in to see if he could help. I told him what was going on. And he said, John, jump in and see if you can start the car. So I jumped in and turned the key and it made the same strange noise. And he looked at me and he gave me a very concerned look. He walked back to his truck, came back with a big wrench and he stuck it down inside the engine, connected it to something, and he gave a huge tug. Nothing happened. He regripped the wrench and he tugged again. Again, nothing happened. One more time, he went through the same exercise and then he pulled out the wrench. He bowed his head and he began to shake it back and forth. And he looked at me and he said, John, the engine's locked up. I said, what's that mean? He said, the engine is shot you're going to have to replace the car. Well, I immediately said, well, how did that happen? Well, he walks to the engine. He pulls the dipstick that measures the amount of oil in the vehicle, and it was bone dry. There was no oil in the engine. So lesson one, shame on me for not being a good husband and a good steward of my wife's vehicle and doing regular maintenance on her car. Now, I asked my wife if she'd noticed anything strange about her car, and she said, yeah, she noticed this little red light, this little red engine thing, as she described it, had lit up on the dashboard, but she didn't know what it meant. The car was running fine, so she didn't think it was important, and when she got home, she was busy unloading groceries and forgot to tell me. The next day, she drove the car again. The light was on. It was driving fine, so she thought, well, it's probably nothing. Well, I could be upset, and but at that point, what difference would it make if I got upset? It would only make a bad situation worse. My wife had never been taught anything about automobiles growing up. And the guy that sold her the car didn't take the time to explain to her what the warning lights were on the vehicle and the importance of having those checked. Neither did I when we were dating or after we got married. Again, a valuable lesson learned. So I learned to pay more attention to my wife's vehicle, which I sell and drive even to this day. And she learned a valuable lesson too, to let me know when that check engine light or any other warning light on the car comes on so we can get that checked immediately. Now, my mechanic smiled after he shared the bad news and he made an interesting comment that stuck with me for years. Here's what he said. He said, John, when you put a duct tape on the engine light by ignoring it's there, the problem doesn't go away. You know what? I thought about that. How many times have we put a Band-Aid or duct tape on a problem simply to hide it from being there 
rather than addressing the problem we know is there and dealing with it. Now, for my wife and I, having to replace a vehicle because the engine had been blown was a painful ripping of the duct tape of ignoring something we should have known needed fixed. But it was a valuable lesson learned that is carried over into other areas of our lives. When you put the duct tape on the check engine light of your life, the problem doesn't go away. Now, think about what I just said. How often do you and I put a Band-Aid or duct tape on the check engine light of our lives by either ignoring a problem or masking it rather than dealing with the issue at hand? Two classic examples. We're overweight, so rather than correcting our diet and getting our weight back into the normal parameters, we simply stop stepping on the scale. We know we're spending too much money, so when we get the credit card statement, we only look to see what's the minimum amount we have to pay, and we don't look at that balance that's continuing to grow by not only the amount of money we're adding to it, but the horrendous amount of interest that's accumulating every single month. So those are two right out of the chute, but I want to go a little bit deeper, and this is where it's going to get uncomfortable. And since I've already stepped on your toes, bear with me if I step on them once again. According to a 2023 national health study, one in 10 American adults today have been prescribed antidepressants. That's one of the largest increases in antidepressant use in human history, a 35% increase in just six short years. Now, while there are legitimate uses for antidepressants, and there are people that do suffer from clinical issues that require these medications to function, the massive increase in the prescription of antidepressants among American adults begs the question, are we duct taping the check engine light of our lives, simply hoping the problem were going away, or being willing to take a pill to mask and hide the problem rather than dealing with the issues in our lives? Now, I want to say again that depression and anxiety are very real issues for some people to deal with. But what we're seeing today is a growing body of evidence that we're engaging in behaviors that are fueling an unhealthy spike in self-imposed depression, stress, and anxiety. So when I saw this statistic, I had to ask myself, why is this happening? And as I dug a little deeper, let me share with you what I found. Smartphones were introduced in 2007, and just eight years later, 2015, fully 92% of teens and young adults owned a smartphone. A San Diego State University study found a strong correlation between smartphone adoption and an increase in anxiety and depression. Now, as I thought about that study, I thought about the number of children I see as young as four or five years of age growing up with a smartphone because their parents had given that to them with unfettered access often to the internet and all of the garbage that's there. And I have to ask myself, are parents setting their children up for failure by introducing a device to them that is known to increase the rates of anxiety and depression in teens? And young adults. So again, digging a little deeper, I found another National Health Institute study that shows a direct correlation between time spent on social media, which is designed to be a social communication and a social gathering place, a direct correlation between time spent on social media and perceived social isolation, feelings of being alone, and a direct correlation between time spent on social media and a rise in the fear of missing out. People have become so obsessed with what's going on in the world of social media, they're constantly scrolling incessantly seven, eight, nine hours a day because of the fear of missing out on something. Now, there are other studies that have found a direct correlation between a loss of self-esteem and a loss of self-confidence among teen and young adult women based upon the time they spend on social media. This study found that curated images of women appearing prettier, thinner, more popular, or richer are fueling increasing feelings of anxiety, depression, 
and worries about body image among teens and young adult women. Again, pushing them into these feelings of inferiority. Now, with the advent of smartphones, we've also seen a significant decline in individuals here in the United States and around the world engaging in physical activity and personal growth activities. I'm talking about things to strengthen the physical body and to give the physical body what it needs to be successful and to function in life. And about personal growth activities, I'm talking about learning a new skill, honing a talent, or doing things to grow and stretch your thinking to become a better version of who you are and what you do so you can step in to your full potential. Today, rising to our full potential has been replaced by mindlessly scrolling for hours to see what other people are doing online. Now, what I did learn from looking into this study of identifying this lack of physical activity and this lack of personal growth is this. Physical activity and personal growth activities not only stimulate the body and stimulate the brain, they improve concentration, they improve focus, and they improve our physical well-being, how we feel about ourselves. But if we're so busy mindlessly scrolling through social media that we're not getting the exercise our body needs, we're not getting the wellness benefits that come from that. And when we're not stimulating our brain to improve our concentration and our focus by learning new skills, by honing a talent and stretching the quality of our thinking to improve who we are as individuals, we miss out on one thing. Physical activity, personal growth activities give us a sense of accomplishment and fulfillment that we don't get from scrolling social media. So what else is causing this problem? As I looked at this statistic, one in 10 Americans today on antidepressants, here's another observation I took from simply looking at the world around us and what's going on and what we see in the news today. We live in a culture that glorifies and promotes victimization and oppression. And rather than focusing on the things that unite us, there's a growing push in society today to divide people into buckets by race, by gender by skin color, by religion, by sex, or by ideology. And if you don't look, act, or behave in a certain way, society today, at least a growing number of people in society today, seek to cancel you as if you don't even exist. Now, thinking back just a few short years ago, we agreed to disagree. We had debate. We would listen to competing ideas in an open forum, much as the ancient Greeks did in centuries past, and have an opportunity to debate and discuss ideas and hear both sides of an argument. Today, that doesn't happen. Rather than having an open forum where these ideas can be discussed and debated, and we can learn from one another and agree to disagree on minors, but find the things we can agree upon and work together, what do we do? Today, people are retreating into these Me Too clubs that only want to hear from people who look and act like them. The vast majority of people being social creatures fear being left out or being alone and as a result, yield their ability to think and act independently and conform to a culture of groupthink. George Orwell coming to life right here in the United States and around the world. Now add to that a pandemic we just went through that locked people away for nearly two years significantly amplifying the isolation many people were feeling from mindlessly scrolling social media, add to that not just the pandemic, but global unrest. Highest inflation we've seen in almost 40 years. It is a perfect recipe for stoking fear, anxiety, depression, and anger. You know, I saw a study just yesterday that said it requires a family $11,000 more in 2023 to enjoy the same lifestyle they enjoyed just a couple of years before because of rising prices. That in itself is enough to stress out a lot of people. We've seen credit card debt top over $1 trillion as people are stressed trying to get by. And again, rather than changing habits, they continue the same habits, 
only digging the stress hole deeper and deeper and finding themselves having to crawl higher and higher to get their way out. But what we haven't learned as a society is coping skills. We haven't learned how to effectively use and manage stress to learn, to grow, to improve, and to become a better version of ourselves. We've not developed critical thinking skills because our education system today is not focused on teaching us how to think. It's more focused on teaching us what to think. Add to that the fact that history has been whitewashed or erased so the lessons of the past can't be learned and shared or history is being completely rewritten to share lessons that are untrue and don't give you a full picture of what really happened in the past. And as a result of that, it fuels this growing sense of victimization and oppressionhood in society today. When you lump all of this together, what do we have? We have a society of individuals that can't cope with reality. They can't handle stress. And as a result of that, they live their lives stressed out, anxious, depressed, afraid, and angry. But when society teaches and encourages and rewards victimization, race hatred, and oppression, what do you get? You get more distrust, more anxiety, more pressure, more depression, and less cooperation and learning to work and live together in harmony. Remember, what gets rewarded gets repeated. And if society is encouraging and rewarding victimization, race hatred, and oppression, society is rewarding the wrong things. Now, this is not leadership. But here's the problem today. When people can't cope, rather than dealing with the stress and looking at the root causes of the issues going on in their lives that are causing the stress, it's much too easy today to run to a doctor and get a pill that masks the symptoms rather than dealing with the root cause of the problem. Now, again, there are legitimate needs for individuals dealing with depression and anxiety to seek out medical intervention and medication is one of the ways that individuals that have those clinical issues can deal with those. But for the vast majority of people, based upon a growing body of evidence we're seeing, much of the flight to the doctor is a flight to put duct tape on the check engine light of our lives. At least that's what the data appears to show. Think about this. And my grandfather was a doctor. Doctors are amazing people and they do incredible things. But a lot of what doctors do is symptoms-based treatment. They ask you for the symptoms you're experiencing and they extrapolate what they believe is going on and they give you a pill to deal with the symptoms. What they don't have time to do is to counsel you as an individual to get to the root cause of the issues going on in your life that are causing depression and anxiety. But what they can do is give you a pill to mask the symptoms so the byproducts of depression and anxiety in your life are softened at some level. It's duct tape. It's a Band-Aid. It's not dealing with the root cause of the problem. And for far too many of us in society today, that check engine soon light is glaring red. But rather than dealing with the problems and running to the doctor, you're only getting a prescription that masks the symptoms. It doesn't address the underlying cause. It's duct tape for the brain. It's like driving down the highway, not paying any attention to the fuel gauge, oblivious to the fact that you're about to run out of gas and you keep pressing the accelerator further and further and going faster and faster. And then you're shocked when you run out of gas and you can't go any farther. Duct tape for the brain. Now think about it. When you duct tape your brain, what are you doing? You're yielding control of your life to your circumstances, your situations, or other people. You become oblivious to the cause of the stress because you've not taken time to examine what's going on to discover the root cause of the stress that's causing the anxiety and depression in your life. You keep doing the very same things that are causing the stress because we're all creatures of habit. And until we change our habits, we're going to experience the same outcomes over and over 
But if we do the same things the same way that are driving more stress, more anxiety, more depression, we're simply amplifying what's causing the wrong in our lives and we're adding to it every single day. We're digging the hole deeper and deeper and we're wondering why the world around us is getting darker and darker. Now, you may ask the question, well, John, why do we do that? Well, here's what we know as we look and examine human behavior. It's easier to make an excuse for bad behavior than it is to go through the process of changing a bad behavior. It's easier to run to the doctor and get a pill than it is to try to stop eating so much, to stop spending so much, to stop mindlessly scrolling through social media that's only feeding our mind negative things that are pulling us down rather than lifting us up. So as a result of that, what do we do? We wallow in self-pity. We go around whining and complaining and making excuses why life isn't fair and everything in our life is bad. And because misery loves company, what do you do? You go out and find other people just like you who are stressed, anxious, and depressed, stuck where they are just like you, and you woe and waller and share in the misery together. Why? Because it's easier to make an excuse than it is to be willing to do what's necessary to change your habits and behaviors to create a better outcome. Yeah, it's easier to run to the doctor and get a pill that makes us feel better, at least for the moment, than it is to go through the painful process of changing a bad habit or a bad behavior and learning to cope with stress, anxiety, depression, rejection, and all the other stressors in our lives. But looking back just a few decades ago, we didn't see that. People understood how to deal with stress and how to deal with it in a positive way and use that as a means to grow themselves and expand themselves rather than yielding to the pressure and seeing yourself as a victim rather than a victor. So understand this. Life is a series of choices and consequences. If you've been listening to me for any amount of time, you know I share this thought often. Life is a series of choices and consequences. And every day, you and I get to choose the choices that we choose to make. The consequences we experience in life is a direct result of the choices that you and I have made. So how do we stop putting duct tape on the check engine light of our lives? How do we stop putting a Band-Aid on the brain? Well, let me give you some tips. First, you've got to step back and examine yourself. You know, if you go back and you look at one of the ancient Greek temples, there were two words that appeared on that ancient temple, and it said, know thyself. That is a powerful statement because it requires that you know yourself and be intentional about knowing who you are and what's going on inside of you in your thinking. So that means to know yourself, you've got to step back and you've got to have that very uncomfortable man in the mirror woman in the mirror moment conversation with yourself. You've got to take a candid, honest, reflective, and sometimes painful look at what you're doing and how it's affecting your welfare and your well-being. You've got to ask yourself why you're stressed, why you're anxious, or why you're depressed and start looking for the triggers that are causing it. You've got to start looking for the root cause of the problem to have an opportunity to fix that. And when you can fix the root cause, the symptoms over time go away. It's like trying to turn off a water faucet that's dripping and you keep turning it tighter and tighter rather than calling a plumber to fix the root cause of a washer that maybe has worn or a device inside the spigot itself that needs to be replaced. Having a candid, honest conversation with yourself. And here's what I tell you, when you do that, it is amazing what you're going to uncover when you spend time in reflective thinking. When you take the time to become intentional about what's going on in your life and the behaviors you're engaged in that are actually elevating the stressors in your life. So step one, know yourself. Step two, choose to be happy. 
Remember, life is a series of choices and consequences, and we get to choose our choices. So every day we can choose whether you get happy or you get sad. You know, growing up, my mom used to say, you can get happy in the same pair of pants you got mad in. And I remember that statement to this day, and I find myself telling it to my kids and even to my grandkids when they're having an issue that they're allowing their emotions to take control of their lives. So here's a tip to choose to be happy. Stop seeing the world as half empty and choose to see the world as half full. When you're constantly looking for what's wrong in life, that's all you're going to see. But when you take the time to start looking for what's right in life and what's good in life, you're going to begin to see more of that and less of what's wrong. Now, one of the ways you can do that to shift your mindset, which is really what it is, it's a mindset shift, is to start a gratitude journal. Now, you may say, John, what in the world is that? Well, a gratitude journal is simply uh, a, a journal that you can go pick up at Walmart, Target, Dollar General, any store that sells little composition books like you would use in college. They're a dollar, dollar and a half, two bucks a piece. Get a gratitude journal. Go buy you a composition notebook. And every night before you go to bed, spend 10 to 15 minutes thinking and writing down about individuals that you were grateful for today and things you experienced that you could be grateful for. Essentially, who and what you're grateful for today. Take 10 to 15 minutes right before you go to sleep to do that. Now, that's important because your subconscious mind never sleeps. And when the last thoughts of the day are focused on what you're grateful for, your subconscious mind is going to dwell and expand upon that as you sleep. And slowly over time, it's going to begin to shift your mindset to more of an attitude of gratitude that I spoke about in last week's lesson. So remember, happiness is a choice and you're only as happy as you choose to be. So choose to be happy. Hey, one last tip to help you with that. Affirmations are a powerful tool to help you shift your mindset, to change your beliefs and to improve your self-esteem. There's a powerful free resource in the courses section of my website entitled The Power of Affirming Words. It's a free resource, and you'll find that there along with several other free and paid resources at BeAblackBeltLeader.com. Again, that's BeAblackBeltLeader.com. So know yourself. Choose to be happy. Here's the third and final point. Stop seeing challenges in life as roadblocks. Remember, you see what you're looking for. So the question is this, what are you looking for in life? Don't forget your outlook determines your outcome. You've heard me say that again and again as well. When we view a challenge that we're dealing with in life as an obstacle or a roadblock, it creates in our mind an I'm stuck mindset. Because you can't get around an obstacle. You can't get around a roadblock. You simply either got to stop or turn around and go back the way you came. When you have an I'm stuck mindset, it leaves you as you are, where you are, unchanged. And you're going to experience more of the same. And once you believe and accept the fact that you're stuck, your brain is going to reject any information to the contrary that tries to say, hey, try this way or try that way or try this or try that. It simply says, I'm stuck. I can't go forward. And you either stop moving and stay where you are, or you turn around and retreat into the stressors and anxieties and depressors that have held you down for so long. Because when you've got an I stuck mindset, all you can see is an obstacle or a roadblock with no way forward. So if you feel stuck, unsatisfied, unfulfilled, what are you doing? You're only fueling more stress, anxiety, and depression in your life. So stop viewing challenges as roadblocks. On the other hand, when you view a challenge as an opportunity, you begin to see how this challenge can let you learn something new, grow in some way, or you find a new way to keep moving forward. When you view a challenge as an opportunity, you shift your mindset from I can't 
to I can. And when you make that shift in your thinking from I can't to I can, it opens your mind to consider possibilities and outcomes you haven't considered before. When you move from I can't to I can, you stop seeing obstacles and roadblocks. Instead, you start seeing detours and alternate routes to get you to where you ultimately want to go. So here's my challenge to you this week. If you're living life stressed, anxious, or depressed, take a step back and examine your life. To be honest, you likely already know what you need to do to change things for the better. And if so, simply start doing those. If you don't or you need some help, go hire a coach or see a counselor who can help you uncover what you need to do to change things for the better. So let me encourage you to take that first uncomfortable step you need to do to change things for the better in your life. Shift your focus from what's wrong in your life and in the world around you and instead start focusing on what's right in your life and what's right in the world around you. Hire a life coach to help you put together a success plan for life. You know, Coach Tom Landry, the amazing coach of the Dallas Cowboys said it well. A coach is someone who tells you what you don't want to hear, who has you see what you don't want to see, so you can be who you've always known you could be. If you need professional help, go get it. If you need medication, take it. There's no shame in that. Do what you need to do to get back to a healthy, vibrant version of you. But just make sure you're not putting duct tape on the brain and failing to address the root causes of what's stressing you out or making you anxious or depressed. Remember, stress rightly used can be a powerful catalyst for your personal growth. So don't spend the rest of your life oblivious to what's going on in your life and how it's affecting not only you, but those around you. Identify the habits you're engaged in right now that are fueling your worst life now and replace those habits with better habits that fuel your best life now. Remember, black belt leaders challenge the status quo to change things for the better. And it starts with ripping off the duct tape. I'm Dr. John Terry, the Black Belt Leader. Thanks for joining me and have a great day.